Good morning, everyone. Pleasure to be here. My name is Olawi Kendi. I'm Nigerian and I'm a PhD candidate in international economic law and Chinese University of Hong Kong. So today I'll be making a presentation entitled Transnational Law on the Protection of Foreign Investments and Terrorism in Developing Countries. Um, so, I sort of remember exactly where I was on 9-11. I'm sure you know, if we, we can all you know, remember where we were, you know, when we heard you know, that the attacks had occurred. I you know exactly what I was wearing as well. You know, for me, it sort of felt like the world was changing or the world had changed. I had no idea, you know, very, very little idea of or an understanding of what was going on, but I sort of was conscious that things were not going to be the same. And as you know, we sort of lead forces in international lawyers, we live in the post 9 11 world. Now, last summer, 16 years after the attacks, I happened on the exact 16th year anniversary of the attack. I was walking past, I, I passed to the Newark Airport and there was a memorial which was put to me by the United Airlines in honor of the, um, the flight I was in and they were here from the Pentagon. But passing by, you know, 16 years prior and then 16 years after, one in the process I've become an international law lawyer. I deal with international investment court. And my thought process obviously is very different. When I think about terrorism, I think about it as you know, experiences, and also I also think about the legal dimensions. And that's what I'll be doing in my presentation today. I'll be exploring dimensions between international economic law and international investment law. So the outline of my introduction basically I'll explain my research problem, the research question. Explain the rise of terror in Africa, which is my immediate context for my presentation. And then look at this from a transnational law approach. Examine the and the relationship between international investment law and terrorism and make a few concluding remarks. So the research question, my basic research question is what standards of, pro of protection are applicable to the relationship between foreign investors and developing what post-its following the terrorist attack. Now, the basic question you may ask is, what then is international investment law? International investment law or transnational investment law, which is a term I think to prefer, can be described as norms which, you know, international, transnational, and national norms applicable to the regulation of foreign, or to the regulation of economic activity within a state. So a host state, where in Israel, as in Israel is the host state and is a foreign investor, a foreign investor can be, for instance, Samsung, which is registered in Korea. It's a Korean company. Now, the area of law I deal with is the law that applies to that relationship between a foreign company, which as it were is an alien company, and the host state. Now, the host state I deal with, or in this presentation, is developing countries. <coughs> Developing countries as defined by the World Bank. In Africa, for instance, I would say most of the countries in Africa are developing countries. Now, the premise on which countries, developing countries, or African developing countries, decided to give their consent to international investment law is the basic fact that if there's criticality, if you sign an investment agreement, or if you sign an investment contract. This is rule of law. And if you do this, then there will be economic prosperity and there will be economic prosperity. But what we find is in the last 60 years, post-colonial reason, many developing countries in Africa are still very poor, even though they have large quantities of natural resources. So what's the problem? This is another problem I encountered. Now, the problem even has a different dimension when you consider that. There can be a terrorist attack, and after the terrorist attack, this developing country may even find that it has greater liabilities. 
So what do developing countries do? And then what do states do? So the basic thing, problem is how do you balance the rights <coughs> of the host state and the rights of the investor? Legitimate rights. The investor has a legitimate right of protection. And at the same time, the host state has the right to control the economic activity within the state. So the rights of terror, this you know, is just an example, just to give you, you know, an illustration of how terrorist you know, attacks are sort of becoming more commonplace in Africa. Yes, we've always had forms of conflict, you know, but we've always had forms of you know, civil unrest and things like that. But I'll say in the last 10 years, we've witnessed a significant increase in terrorist attacks. And notably, these attacks have also targeted foreign owned property, including pipelines, you know, tourists, hotels, you know, resorts. And I think this raises very, very critical questions of the relationship that exists between international terrorism and international investment. So for developing states, the responsibility to protect foreign investors against terrorist-related activities may conflict with standards which recognize a host state's level of development in determining its liability. Now, this is another illustration of the kind of activities that are going on in Africa and why this is important. As you see in the first picture and the second picture, you have um, the president of France and the president of Mali in Africa. And this is you know, called Operation Dakin. And basically, what you have is um, 4,000 French troops in West Africa, specifically Chad, Mali, Nigeria, and Cameroon, which are all part of West Africa. Now, notably, I don't know, maybe, I mean, some of us may have been aware recently, from October 2017, people were really, really surprised that American troops were, um, were located or were operating in West Africa. And the allegations in the literature that this is related to increasing terrorist activities and is also related to oil pipelines and America's interest in oil um, oil blocks in West Africa. So this is just you know, to just give you some background on why this topic is important. And then terrorist attacks on foreigners, as you can see, you know, the first picture shows you, you know. That is you know, an attack on an oil pipeline in Nigeria. And then the second one is the um, terrorist attacks in uh, Marco, I believe, in 2017. So basically, what you find is the local population is now not, it's not just the primary target. Foreigners are now becoming, you know, very, very, you know, I would say, what's the word that I'll use? I'll use the word convenient. It's convenient to attack foreigners in okay. Well, not convenient, but it sort of has, I believe, for terrorists or for people who you know, have the intention to, to um, create uh, um, situations of terror, is the realization that if you attack the terrorists, you get more international exposure. You know, it's not just going to be about the local population, and then it sounds a message out. And then I also even be an intention to drive foreigners in. I don't know. It's you know, it's very very you know, very complex. So to deal with um, my um, problem, basically what I do is I look at international investment law as transnational law, and then I also look at the war on terrorism as transnational law. And at the same time, I look at how the rule of law works as crossroads between international investment law and the war of terrorism. And and in my work, I'm basically influenced by Philip Jacob's <coughs> definition of transnational law in his Thor's lecture of 1956. And for Philip Jacob, at this period, he mentioned mm -hmm. um, many, many subjects which for him represented a shift or a change towards a new kind of international law. But one of the key, or two of the key issues he mentioned was one, terrorism, and two, international investment law. And his basic thesis was that it's difficult for us to examine international law as exclusively state, I mean, involving state parties, private individuals. So private individuals in the sense being forest investors and terrorists. So international, transnational law sort of forms a bridge 
for examining the rights and the liabilities of terrorists and hostages and investors. Um, I explore this further in my in my thesis, and then at the same time, the developing law dimension. But scholars of international law who belong to those school that you can call third world approaches to international law. But these scholars, transnational law, being investment law, and transnational law as one pair, sort of represents Western led, um, Western led, I would say, you know, neo imperialism basically. So they look at, so for a third world scholar of international law, he may consider the fact that when there's a terrorist situation, there's rule of law, rule of law being predictability and upholding the, um, the contract or the investment the treaty that has been entered between the host state and the investor. The third world scholar would consider that as essentially unfair, as essentially neo colonialism. But in my own argument, what I argue is we have to look at law in practice and move beyond making just critical analysis. So how does the law operate in practice? I'll come back to this later. So the third world, as I mentioned, for instance, Professor Sonia Raja, who is a leading scholar of international investment law. I found this very interesting comment he made at the ASEL conference in 1999. It's interesting, this was prior to the terrorist attacks. But for him, basically, terrorism is an emotive term is to manipulate political emotion and to have no function whatsoever in law and as an independent concept. And so Raja you know, makes the same claim about international investment law. He calls it a fraudulent system, he calls it a lopsided system, which is in favor of developing countries. So in favor of developed countries. So rule of law, terrorism and international investment law. What I find is rule of law is central to international investment law. And at the same time it's central to the war on terrorism or the international law on terrorism. But the interesting thing is, rule of law in international law, investment law, is slightly different from war on terrorism. So the war on terrorism basically has to do with human rights, immigration, you know, things like that, the European Union and everything, court of justice of the On the other hand, when it comes to international investment law, the key concepts of rule of law are predictability, pre investment contracts, protection standards and the essential principle is a state party or a, you know, a state party will be held accountable for any commitment it makes to a foreign investor and how does the investment law do this? Investment law does this by standards of protection by ensuring that there's an independent means for settling this piece, like international arbitration. The first um, standard I would like to consider is the full protection and security standard. Now, in investment treaties, you have lots of standards. So you have most favored nation, uh, nation principles, you have national treatment, you have you know, very, very broad clauses. What I find is, I found only one, one investment treaty that actually mentions the word terrorism. And right? this is the treaty that was signed between the United States and Canada in 1989. This is the only treaty. Interestingly, um, I believe the 1989 or 1980 model of the model of bilateral investment treaty of the United States does mention the word terrorism, but you don't find it in its subsequent model of the ITs of, tw of 2014 and 2004, I believe. So it's very, very interesting. The question which now arises is how does terrorism fit into all this? If the investment treaties don't even mention the word terrorism. So what you find in investment treaties is armed conflict, civil unrest, strike. That's what you generally find. Now going back to full protection and security, the um clause I have put up there is basically the Act's short cross draft of nineteen fifty nine. And the reason why I have put this up here is because it's a representation of what you find in subsequent bilateral investment treaties. Now, there are over 3,000 bilateral investment treaties that have been signed between different states. But it's also important to consider that most of these treaties look alike, but there are significant differences in the text and the form. And we'll come back to this later. But basically, what we see is property shall be accorded most constant protection 
and security. This word is very, very simple, but I assure you, they have very, very strong weight, and arbitral tribunals have, you know, even though in practice it's been interpreted to mean near due diligence, due diligence, as lawyers are used to due diligence, you know. Due diligence, you do what you can, you do your best, and that's fine. But as you shall see, these words have strong implications in practice. Now, the second means for um, protection during terrorist attacks would be force majeure and investment insurance. Now, as I've, I've, I've mentioned, I've said a lot of things about investment treaties, but it's also important to consider that in any relationship between a foreign investor and a host state, there is always a contract. There is always an investment contract. And in certain instances, there is no existing bilateral investment treaty. There is no existing free trade agreement. The only legal instrument for regulating the relationship between the investor and the host state is the investment contract. And in that situation, the force majeure clause is very, very important. And one key thing, though, about investment contracts is that they're not really available in public. So it's very, very difficult to determine or to, um, to identify what they look like in practice. But I have been able to see a few ones, you know, sometimes cut with um, the arbitral tribunal would specifically mention force majeure clause. And you see that in most instances, terrorism is covered under the force majeure clause. Now, in practice, this can operate in different ways, but it's, it's a bit difficult to, you know, examine this in practice because of the limited availability of arbitral arbitrators. Traditionally, investment arbitration is very confidential. It's a confidential process. So our words are not generally made publicly available, although this practice is changing. So arbitral and um, jurisprudence. Now, when I would tell us that this is you know, one of the classical cases on full protection and security. And in this case, the tribunal basically said that FPS is not a strict liability, but however, states cannot use emergency situations to escape contractual obligations. And this decision is you know, very, very relevant and has been applied you know, by subsequent arbitral tribunals. And essentially, what it means is when there's a situation, the contract remains the most important thing. Any you know, emergency, any whatever it is, is not sufficient. Now, the thing which the, the question which now arises is what happens to a developing country? A developing country that doesn't that depends, as you saw in, in, in one of these um, slides, a developing country that de that depends on foreign troops doesn't even have its own troops to defend its own people. Focus on troops to defend foreigners. So in this um this this is you know, one in this um the sole arbitrator basically said you know. An investor in investing in an area with endemic civil strife and poor governments cannot have the same expectation of physical security as one investing in London, New York, or Tokyo. And I will add, as someone investing in Ghana, Nigeria, Egypt, maybe. So in practice, tribunals will likely consider the state level of development and stability as relevant circumstance in determining the state's level of development. Now, these are two different kinds of you know, methods that have been adopted by arbitral tribunals. So on the one hand, you have tribunals that tend to consider the development of the level of development of the host state in determining liability. And then on the other hand, you have tribunals that would. Now, this is one also important key characteristic of international investment. Here. There is no um, world that there is no Subsequent tribunals are not bound by the decision of the prior tribunal. So it can go anywhere, depending on the circumstances of the case and depending on how the parties can make their cases and present evidence. So um, I'll talk, you know, this is one key decision that has sort of you know, inspired my um, my research or maybe more interested, interested in my research. And this is I'm you know. American Legal Corporation versus Egypt in 2017. Now it's important to note that there are other disputes where terrorism is an issue. So you know, there are other disputes, but this is the first one that's publicly available. And in this 
decision basically what the tribunal said was you know there's been a terrorist attack and you are liable you know it's a breach of FPS. Now this decision has been criticized for a number of reasons and basically what a few people will say is you know, why would you uphold this kind of decision there's an emergency the state is not even directly involved in the attack so why would you hold the state liable for I mean, it emphasizes due diligence, it's tried, it's in a way that helps. But this decision, you know, just shows you, you know, the liability that states will find themselves in. So there are several pending cases, and then there are other disputes which, you know, are on appeal, which are sort of related, to, especially because of, you know, the rise of, you know, terrorist attacks and things like that. Now, of course, the, the bilateral investment treaty, which was used, which was the basis of this decision, doesn't mention the word terrorism. But it has the full protection standard. So obviously, without you know making any, you know, without making any fire parachute decisions, existing bilateral investment treaties will cover terrorist activities. Then making my conclusion, basically, I have examined you know, the relationship between terrorism and international investment. So, however, in making my argument or the approach I developed, it's sort of finding you know, a balance between the, the state's sovereignty over its economic activity and at the same time, the rights of the investor. And what I argue basically is for fair standards, at least let's understand what the law is like in practice. So for a developing country, because there are several arguments that develop, most developing countries in Africa are rule takers. They don't understand law, or they understand fully, or there are claims that many developing countries don't understand fully the legal implications of which is the enter into. Also, claims that most times when contracts are signed, it's just, you know, let's shake hands and, you know, let's, you know, gentleman contracts. But the truth is, emergency. Disputes, all these are unforeseen activities. Nobody really, really foresees that these things will happen in the future. And for a developing country and for a host, I mean for a host developing country, the host developing country has to understand that the basis of international investment law is contracts, not rule of law. Yeah, rule of law in practice, but it is contracts. You are held accountable for every contract that you enter into. Treaties, whatever, it is all about contract, and you're going to be held accountable for this contract. Now, there's an interesting development. So, because of this controversy about the full protection standard, parties or states have decided that they're going to exclude the FPS standard from subsequent treaties. So, for instance, the SEDC, which is the South African Development um, Economic Group in, in Africa, excludes the FPS standard from its. Um, model investment treaty. We also have the Pan-African Investment Code, which makes no reference to full protection of security. So this is an attempt by states to exclude themselves from this kind of things. But remember, there are over 3,000 existing bilateral investment treaties. Many of these treaties are enforced. And importantly, tribunals have imported full protection and security standards from third-party investment treaties. So, so, for example, let's say Israel signs a bilateral investment treaty with Egypt in 2001. This treaty doesn't have a full protection and security clause. Now, Israel has signed another treaty with, let's say, the United States in 1998 that has over, and let's choose dates that are very close to so 2001 and let's say 2000. So Israel signed a bilateral investment treaty with the United States in 2001, and this treaty has a full protection and security clause. The tribunal can import the FPS clause from the treaty signed with the U.S. in settling the disputes between the U.S. and the third party states. So this has very, very serious implications. So I think you know, finding the balance is sort of very difficult. At the same time, on one hand, you have a developing host state and then who is you know, eager for development. And at the same time, it's probably trying to fight terrorist activities. And then on the other hand, you have an investor that has made significant investment in a host state. 
So how do you, you know, how do you, it's, it's sort of, you know, it creates sort of dilemmas. But at the same time, I believe, you know, it's possible to manage this relationship. But it's, 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 it's sort of really, really difficult. But so basically, in my presentation, I have just, you know, some really examined, you know, the relationship between international investment and terrorism. And one of the arguments I make or the essential argument I make is that the rule of law function played by international investment law can diminish in of and following a terrorist attack. So um, thank you very much for listening. I hope I didn't bore you too much. Okay. <laughs> I look forward to receiving your comments and questions and of course thank you. So thank you. Thank you so much. How much time do we have? Fifteen minutes, and I left. We're not striking time. Thank you. Should I know this? Yeah. Um, you want me to introduce myself? Yeah. Shortly, just one to send this. Okay. okay. Uh, Ali Black, Professor of Law, uh, National Economic Law, and Berlin University. So, um, I, I I want to congratulate you to uh, to choosing this topic. It's a very uh, interesting, very timely issue because you bring together two very hot topics and you show how they intercede, how they clash. You know, you know, one, on the one hand, we have this problem of uh, global terrorism and global fight against terrorism, which is obviously in this time and age is a very uh, hot and problematic topic that all states, and not just in Africa, all over the world, um, are, are grappling with. Uh, you know, on the other hand, we have uh, the issue of international investment protection, which, while in Israel, it's almost completely unknown. I just gave a lecture on it last week in, before the uh, Israel Bar Association. I said, this topic is a very well-kept state secret, <laughs> because the Israeli lawyers don't know about it, almost. Uh, whereas in Europe, you have people going out and getting in the streets, making uh, 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 demonstrations in the street against, uh, for instance, the, the, the what was it, the, the TIPP, um, because of the investment uh, the chapter, etc. Um, but anyway, so but, but in the world in general, this is a hot uh, topic, and. Um, and, uh, and and here we have an issue where, where to, to see how they intercede and uh, uh, can help each other or maybe clash. Um, and the, the paper, uh, I think, serves the topic well. It raises the many dilemmas that uh, these issues uh, raise. Uh, and um, in particular in the African contract, context. And... Uh, it also does so in a rich theoretical context, and, and that's also a good thing that you bring up the, the, the controversies in the literature, uh, both empirical controversies, political controversies, uh, 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 legal controversies that, that are relevant to this uh, topic. So first you start with describing the problems of terrorism in Africa and the state difficulties with dealing with it. Um, you also uh, describe the, the problems not just of terrorism but also of counter-terrorism uh, that of course raises issues of human rights protection and uh, have the risk of becoming a pretext for autocratic regimes to restrict democracy and to restrict uh, citizens' rights to the point where one wonders what is the greater danger, whether it's terrorism or the counter-terrorism. Um, and I also noted the, the, the quote that you brought, which was very interesting, by Professor Sorna Raja, I think you pronounce it, who, who is a leading expert on international investment law. And, uh, and he thinks that the term terrorism is not useful at all as a, as a term in international law or in ter as a term uh, uh, also in connection to international investment law. And maybe that's the reason that we don't find it in bilateral investment treaty, mm -hmm. um, and he, he as, you, as, as you quoted here, that he says that this is an emotive term used to manipulate political emotion, which have no, which should have no function in law as an independent concept. End of quote. I don't think I agree with him. Mm -hmm. I think I dispute this opinion, uh, but but this is a different a, 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 a issue. I don't want to go into that uh, right now. Uh, but 
So let's go in a little bit to 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 the problem that that this uh, issue raises. So, uh, so terrorism is a general problem. Terrorism uh, the terrorists will often target regular citizens and and, and hit the state uh, where it can or where it will hurt most. And to attack foreign investors, that increases the 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 damage. Which is what the terrorists are looking for, because you don't only attack certain investment uh, and or investor, you also uh, attack future investment. You you, you prevent future inve investment uh, because of the deterring effect that this has on potential uh, foreign investment. And and this is where international law on foreign investment protection may have an important role to play because. If it will ensure compensation, then at least it can mitigate that damaging effect of, of terrorism. In that sense, it, 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 it can help in the fight against terrorism. Um, now, you, you, you rightly so bemoan the fact that we don't have an agreed international de definition of terrorism. Uh, in international law, which I think is a problem that is indicative of the politics that distort uh, current challenges of international law. Um, and by the way, in this context, it would be interested, interesting to find out, you note a very interesting point, which you also mentioned uh, now, that uh, in, in one of the versions of the US model uh, uh, bit, the Latin Investment Treaty, they inserted the word terrorism in the provision on full security and protection, whereas later on, I think 2004, they deleted it. It would be very interesting to understand why. Usually they will explain in the, in the explanatory uh, why, why they did that. What is the reason? Does it have to do with problems of, of, uh, of definition or, or what? Maybe it has to do with some of the things that I will, we'll talk about soon, but it's, it would be interesting to find out. Now, uh, <coughs> Coming a bit to the to the to 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 the to the critique, and um, I, I would like to give you some 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 uh, comments that may help help you to improve uh, the paper. I think that the paper could be more clear on what exactly the objective of the paper is. Uh, is this an article serving existing literature? Is, is it serving the relevant issues to the problem of terrorism and international investment agreement, uh, investment law, and how they intercede? Or are you out there to propose a different approach to the one that uh, exists, I don't know, either in the literature or in uh, the rulings of arbitration uh, tribunals? I'm not clear on that. Uh, are you arguing in favor of certain opinions, of certain arbitration rulings and against some others? From the conclusion, it appears that what the paper wants to do is to help the reader to understand some important features of the problem, but it's not entirely clear, uh, and, and it, you could benefit from clarifying this more, because if the, of course if the objective is to make us understand better, then it's important that this message uh, should be more clear and more understandable. And also, to be more pragmatic, it will help to get the article accepted to a publication in a, in a reputed uh, journal, which I think it, it should be. Um, there is a, it has the potential of being accepted because of the importance of the subject. Um, now, at least the version of the paper that I read, I had some problems with it because uh, it was suffering it from, from, from a lack of proofreading. There were sentences and passages that I had a hard time to understand. They, they seem to be missing words uh, or typos. Um, for instance, in many places that the word transitional appears. In the beginning, I thought you were talking about transitional law, which is a topic in international law. But I think after reviewing it, that you meant to write transnational, uh, not transitional. And it, it, it really confused me. Uh, and there's some other examples where you know, those are always the tricky problems when, uh, when a spelling check won't find the word because it's a proper word. It's just not, it's just, it's not just right, the right word, 
with uh, so so you should you should really proofread it more um, carefully. Um, now, I, I want to share some thoughts that I had on the topic, which maybe maybe will maybe won't uh, help you in in your development of the topic. So. I think that the topic is can be characterized as embodying many dilemmas. Uh, so one dilemma, for instance, is um, in, in terms of objective. So what is the objective of foreign investment protection? What 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 is the objective of bilateral investment treaties? So usually, uh, the common understanding is that they're there to help attract. For investment to the to, to countries, developing countries, the countries. I'll talk about that uh, a little bit more soon. But to help, in, uh, we have a problem. The problem is political risk, uh, risk for investment. Uh, this problem causes the fact that countries who need foreign investment more, most don't get it because foreign investors are afraid of putting the money there. And as a result, uh, these these countries don't manage to um, to, to materialize the potential in, in developing. And and by, by setting up these uh, agreements, the idea is that this will help to attract. Now I know there's an argument, empirical argument. It does they do they help? Don't they? Uh, uh, I think there is. I, I mean, I think there is uh, enough uh, proof that they do help to attract. This is something very very hard to. To prove really from a critical point of view, but there are some uh, some 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 uh, research out there that can show that they do. There are also other research that that don't come up with clear evidence. But anyways, if countries uh, do sign them, that is obviously the reason they do. Uh, and here I think there is an interesting point that can be made that FDA, if foreign direct investment in itself, can serve to fight terrorism. Because if we manage to, de to, to develop the country economically to the benefit of the country, not just the benefit of the foreign investor, but to the benefit of the, com the economic, economy of the country as a whole, this raises standard of living. We know that often terrorism grows in countries that are uh, 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 suffering from heavy poverty, lack of rule of law, uh, the government have lack of... <laughs> Uh, of, of resources, uh, if you develop the country uh, through in foreign investment, uh, then you then many much of this can change. The, the government will have more resources, the result of taxes and jobs and less uh, employ you know less unemployment, maybe more education. That in itself can help to fight terrorism and mitigate. Uh, its ability to to secure, but often it's a matter of vacuum of governance. Um, now, um, and 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 therefore, uh, also to protect um, foreign investment, uh, that in itself will will fight uh, terrorism because if. If if uh, if those um, empirical research that say say that they do help to interact uh, for investment uh, are, are are right, then it means that it attracts for investment and then it raises the etc. And um, um, but on the other hand, on the other hand, if we hold the country um, liable. To pay the damages to foreign investment that was uh, that was damaged by terrorism, to a certain extent, you uh, help terrorists to achieve their goal in the sense that they hurt the government. If they want to hurt the government, they hurt them twice. Once they hit the investment, and then they also hit their uh, treasury by having to pay out uh, hundreds of millions, maybe, uh, to the foreign investor. So that's a dilemma. Um, now another issue, which you also uh, you deal with in the paper, is 
uh, you, you, does the obligation under international law to provide full security and protection, does it depend on the state's capabilities? So you said rightly that most uh, tribunals at least have, have ruled that the duty to provide full protection and security is not a, uh, it, it's not an absolute liability. It depends on, uh, you know, due diligence. What you have to do is, you, 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 it's basically like a, similar to a, to a negligence clause. In other words, you have to do what a, what a uh, reasonable state has to do. With. So if you've done that and you still haven't been able to prevent the terrorist act, then you won't be held liable. But if you didn't do what you're supposed, to, what what you could be uh, reasonably expected to do, then you will be held uh, liable. Now here is the question: Is does this depend on the host state's capability or not? So if it does, it would mean that a poor country, a developing country, would be expected to live up to a lower standard than a developed country. Uh, or maybe a better approach would be to impose a standardized, a uniform. Uh, level of care of all states that, that don't, doesn't dep depend on their uh, level of development. I know that I also teach tort law with no connection to international law, but this is a dilemma also in tort law. Do we impose one single uniform uh, a standard for everyone, and if you can't live up to it, then exit? I give, like just for instance, I give an example of a of a physician, a doctor who doesn't read English. He's a great physician, just doesn't read English. So because of that, he can't read, uh, you know, the latest publications in New England, the Journal of Medicine. So he didn't know that there was a problem, and he mis uh, diagnosed a, a, a patient. Uh, so do you do you judge him according to his abilities, or do you say no? There's a standard, and you didn't live up to it. And the standard is that every physician has to be. Uh, uh, acquainted with uh, recent uh, uh, research, at least in the most leading journals, and you didn't live up to that standard, so exit. If you didn't exit, you will be held liable. This is the same question here. Because if we do accept what you seem to be uh, saying that we should, and you also have some authorities that support your view, that there is a different level of uh, care between rich states and, and poor states, don't we perpetuate the problem by saying that, okay, so then it means that the foreign investors are right in being weary of investing in developing countries because here we have a, a, we, we have a, an international ruling that say, yeah, we don't expect from them to be able to protect you the same way that you can be protected in, in developed countries. Okay, then maybe I'll keep my investments in developed countries if, that's a, if that is the case. On the other hand, and, and kind of running out of hands here, but uh, in, in terms of legitimate expectations, just like you quoted, you could say that, you know, but you came to a developing country in Africa, you cannot be legitimately expecting to have the same protection that you have if you uh, invest in Tokyo, or New York, or London. So this is a dilemma, uh, and there's a lot of dilemmas here that, that need to be uh, Dealt with and and um, and and uh, and uh, to, to suggest what the what the proper uh, uh, balance uh, in in these dilemmas are. Um, do I have some more time? Like we're in the strict of time. Okay, uh, so I, I just have two three more uh, comments. And I'll conclude. So uh, I want to say something about. The accusation that international investment law is post post colonialism post colonialism in disguise. Um, I I I, um, I don't like that uh, accusation. Uh, you know, you, it could have some credibility maybe in the past when we found that uh, uh, international investment agreements were mainly uh, signed between rich and poor country, developed and developing countries. That is not the case anymore. Uh, we have many, many examples these days uh, of international investment agreements or international investment protection chapters in free trade agreements that are between developed countries. You know, we have US Australia, we have uh, uh, the NAFTA, we have uh, many, many examples of it. Uh, and by the way, one of my 
claims uh, in, in this recent art, um, article that I published in, on uh, Israel's investment protection policy is that Israel has, has to change its policy because until now we signed uh, bilateral investment treaties mainly with developing countries. So in other words, we saw th those agreements as a tool to protect Israeli investors abroad, not as a tool to attract investment. Uh, and uh, I think that is, that is wrong because we do need to assure uh, foreign investors that they could come here, especially in certain uh, areas. I talk specifically on the, in the energy field where we, where we need to attract more investment and we should sign those. And, and indeed, Israel has done so very recently. We signed an agreement with Japan, which is our, our first ever bilateral uh, uh, investment treaty with a developed country where we could expect to get investment. And indeed, it has, uh, it has, uh, uh, it, it has uh, encouraged immensely the Japanese investors to come and look at Israel. We see, we see it in a very short time. We can already see a huge interest of in, in Japanese investors to come here because because they know that there, we have this agreement and it's a very developed agreement. Although it's like a, it's a new new generation type of agreement with also pre-establishment uh, protection, etc. And um, so for th that that's my first argument. The other one is that uh, I think it's a. It's a counterproductive uh, argument for developing countries because if you see this as post-colonialism, you're basically arguing against it, and you're saying we should stay the way we are, and this, the way we are doesn't seem to be doing very well. And this is the 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 the, the, the strategy that develop, developing countries were taking the, all, all through the 40s, 50s, 60s. I don't think it brought them anywhere. Also, with the spe special uh, special uh, treatment, special uh, that we have in the WTO, I don't think it it really. Uh, Got them any? Got, got them anywhere? Uh, and we know that many developing countries, including in Africa, do suffer from serious problem of, of rule of law, of, of governance, serious governance problems. And uh, in that sense, uh, international law can help to improve the governance in those uh, countries uh, uh, in a good way, not not in a, in a post-colonial. And, and and in fact, those agreements are very often. Uh, uh, replacing the type of gunboat diplomacy that we had before, that that was really, I think, uh, uh, examples of, of post-colonialism. Uh, but if the countries themselves can uh, provide the type of full security and, uh, um, and protection uh, uh, by being encouraged to do so by those agreements, or uh, if they haven't to, to have to pay, then I think it's a, it's a, it's, it's a, an alternative to, to intervention, to foreign intervention that we used to see in the past. So in that sense, it, it's, I think it's an it's a alternative to post-colonialism, not to post-colonialism in, in disguise. Um, and <clears throat> yeah, my, my final uh, comment has to do with the Ample decision, which is really very interesting. Uh, now, the, the issue of, uh, of full protection and security was only one of many issues that were brought up there. There were many other um, reasons why the claim against Egypt was accepted in that, uh, in that arbitration. But indeed, one of them had to do with, um, with that. And I think the point here uh, was, uh, and, and the, the tribunal did accept the fact that uh, that we only hold we will only hold Egypt to due diligence, to, to reasonable uh, measures, and not to more than what they can do. But the point was that they didn't do even that. There was not even a, a single uh, measure taken to try to prevent the thirteen, no less than thirteen attacks on the pipeline uh, between uh, Egypt and Israel and the Sinai, and where and this was also um, compared to measures that they had been taking in other contexts. In, in, in context with the sale of gas to, to Jordan, there they were very diligent in taking measures of protecting the sale and protecting the pipelines and doing other things. When it came to Israel, this uh, was not done and it, and, and it was seen in the context of many calls of politicians, of parliament taking decisions that, that Israel is an enemy and, uh, and we should stop the sales of, of gas to Israel uh, uh, in general, etc. Um, or even though Ample was was not an Israeli company, it was an American company, but they sold the gas to Israel. So, so I think um, 
that that was the basis for for this uh, ruling that they didn't even do the basic things that they could have done, uh, and and uh, states uh, I think should should be kept to their obligations to to provide full security and uh, and protection uh, under due diligence uh, standards. Those are my comments. Thank you. Comments from the. Anyone has, of course. I have a, a small question. Okay, maybe. Uh, when you talk about developing countries, as far as I know, developing countries are categorized in a different way depending on whether we're talking about the World Bank or the IMF. Some countries that even want to be known as developing countries in order to get better tariffs and trade deals. So, Israel is one. <laughs> yeah, we define ourselves still as a developing country, which is a joke. Okay, I do know that. But yeah, having said that, I mean... In Korea, South Korea also. Really? Yeah, in, in the WTO. Yeah. So, for, so, this, for those reasons. Yeah, yeah. So how do you define developing countries in the research study? Because, I mean, even if, if you argue that states should not be bound and be responsible for failing to prevent terrorist attacks in order to make sure that we promote investments. That means that states basically would like to join this developing states list to be paid responsibility and attract more investment. One, I don't argue that states should not be not liable. I tend to argue that states should be not liable. Based on the contract. Yes. yes. You know, so I don't believe you know you can use your status as a developing country to escape your contractual obligation. You know. So I mean I just want to make that clear that mm -hmm. I think it's you know, but my own you know my own argument is against at least understand the implication of what you're entering into. You know that you know you may help the house but I mean that there will be certain exceptions where you know State has, like Professor Michael Newton, the state has done everything possible. It has provided security. The investor has, for instance, come to the state and asked for police protection. And the state has done everything possible. And for whatever reason, even though this protection is in case, you know, maybe the country lacks intelligence or whatever, and the terrorist attack actually happens. So I believe strongly, I don't believe you know, you should you know, use your developing status as a normal Because like you rightly mentioned, then every state would say, oh yeah, we you know, are still developing, or you know, yeah, I don't need the facts or whatever that is. So it's it's just a convenient term for me to you know, use the word developing. But what you find mostly is, how do you define developing a developing country? You need to have resources, you know, most countries in Africa would still be considered developing for whatever reason. Of course, the FDI statistics or whatever are there, you know, but the basic standard of living is not comparable. You, know, you can't compare the you know, standard of living you get to you know, Nigeria to Israel. It's you know, very extremely different. So, yeah, you could be a very, very important thing. Maybe I can add, uh, there, is, there is actually uh, um, three definitions, and there's a developed, developing, and least developed countries. And least developed country, uh, that is, at least has some objective standards to it. This is published by World Bank, I guess, the UN. World Bank, yeah, and it's all accepted by the UN, and there are some, uh, some objective standards, and countries graduate from it as the, when, when the situation improves, they're out of it. And then when they get worse, they go back to it and so on. Uh, whereas developed, at least in, in the W, this is like self uh, declaration, and then it's sometimes uh, motivated by you know by by uh, by wrong by wrong motivation. Thank you. Um, I would just like to point out something or react to something that you responded said regarding the relationship between uh, economic development and the occurrence of terrorism. My background is not in law, I'm in terrorism studies. And from my knowledge of the state of research, that is a highly contested um, claim. Actually, it cannot be shown that there is a correlation between poverty and terrorism in a very, like, in a simple fashion. I mean, those, um, there's very few, 
uh, research projects that have found uh, a positive correlation between uh, economic deprivation and the occurrence of terrorism and that regards um, domestic hang on to me, no um, it, terrorism if the, if the country of origin of a terrorist group is poor then there's higher incentives to attack foreign targets in a rich country but that's about it Generally speaking, there is no correlation between poverty in the, um, in the source country and poverty in the target countries. That's something that, if you do want to make an argument there, you have to be really careful because chances are that a lot of people out there can claim the opposite ground against all this data. Thank you. Thank you so much for a very interesting presentation. Uh, I do. I learned a lot, and uh, we, I think that we both take completely different routes, but and in a rather similar outcome with respect to the content of investment norms. Uh, I wanted to uh, suggest something, maybe. First, with respect to what you were arguing about importing FPS through MFN, mm -hmm. uh, perhaps if you consider FPS also as a rule of customary international law, as was the case in Ankovi, Indonesia. You don't need um, to go through uh, the difficult, somewhat difficult uh, path of uh, MFN and uh, the obligation to act in, in due diligence so as to uh, prevent or at least mitigate <coughs> the damage that may be incurred upon uh, investments is a rule of customary law. But the content of this rule is, of course, a different ball game, but it may be easier to argue. And with respect to the argument on developing states, I wanted to suggest that perhaps a convenient way to go around the question what is a developing state or what is a developing developed state is to look at the norms. So allegedly in international law, rules traditionally developed as uniform absolute standards because they developed amongst civilizations, which is a euphemism. And uh, later with time, the international system became complete with various contextual norms and differential obligations. Now, differential obligations as you've mentioned, are we have hundreds of these in the WTO, in environmental law, and what have you, but contextual norms are slightly different. They account also for socioeconomic consideration, <clears throat> but not in a way that is necessarily indicative of the final outcome. So whereas a differential norm will necessarily result in a lower threshold in favor of certain countries, a contextual norm will take that into account, but will not necessarily result in a lower threshold. So perhaps convenient ways just to examine whether FPS is, say, a contextual norm or a differential one. And I wonder if you have a position on this. Would you like, indeed, FPS to necessarily hold poorer countries, say, to lower standards? Or would you like the assessment of compliance to also be conditioned upon an available means analysis that doesn't necessarily end in a, in a lower threshold? So perhaps this is something that uh, you, you uh, would be able to, to eliminate. I think it's, very, it's difficult to take a position. It's extremely difficult to take a position. So the, what law, the, I mean, law is meant to create a balance. Yeah. How do you create that balance? That's the question. We all, you know, we're used to laws and exceptions. So there are always exceptions. There's a general law and then you know, there's an exception in general. But it's, it, it's hard, you know, but for me, you know, I think, you know, the convenient position, or, you know, yeah, the convenient position is, yes, you're bound by your, your full protection and security, even if you're a developing country. Yes. I think that's, you know, because, like, the um, professor mentioned, although it's agreeable, there's, you know, some of the relationships. So on the one hand, a state who knows it's going, it could be held liable, would maybe spend more of its budget on police protection, and then spending its budget on some heavy bad project. If it knows that, okay, we brought this investor in. If anything happens to this investor, this investment is crucial for the development of our country. And if anything happens to this investor, then we may be held liable. And then the terrorists will be happy. So a whole state will then decide. So, you know, it works both ways. You can work against it or, you know, I, I believe, you know, finding <coughs> that balance is, yes, you've entered into a contract. 
understand your contractual obligations in a is, is that satisfying? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, one small thing, I think that um, Robert House is writing on yeah. Hong Egypt now, um, and uh, specifically on going terrorism, so perhaps you will find it useful to contact him, and I think that you may find some useful evidence also in the literature of uh, Lauge Polson on bounded rationality. Thank you very much. Can I ask a quick question? <laughs> Since from an international law perspective, because I do know anything about investment law, but in international law, there is an obligation that states prevent terrorism, mm -hmm. that terrorist attacks like, from happening within their territory, and that's a due diligence an obligation. Um, so, I guess my question here is that if you actually argue that developing states should be held liable for terrorist attacks against investments, whether there is any risk that other states might intervene, arguing that they have to protect their own investments and their own companies mm -hmm. against terrorism. Because we've seen now, I mean, international law self defense and the use of, uh, uh, use of force in international law has become so blurred after the 9 11 attack. So basically, states can argue for whatever reason that they have to intervene to protect their interests and their sovereignty against the attack. So, my question is whether it's a bit risky that actually you might allow the developed states to intervene in the developing states with the argument that they have to protect their companies or anything. It's, you know, you, you raised the very, you know, the possibilities of that happening are very, very, you know, and very, you know, it's something that could happen. It's, you know, the US has troops in charge and money. And there are arguments that you know the US isn't really interested in, in, in fighting terrorism. The US is more interested in protecting oil. So it wants to protect its oil, you know. But it's you know, so there are lots of parallels, you find these parallels, you know. So what exactly are you fighting against, you know, who's in whose interest? So it's very, very clear. International law can be used as a means for you know political, you know, power and for power, you know. And um, whatever, so it's it's very dicey, you know. But we can only hope that things like this don't happen in the future, where the state uses terror, the foreign in um, country uses terrorism as a means to come in and you know, mess things up. So I hope so I hope this doesn't have to happen in the future. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. It was a very interesting discussion and um, thank you. Thank you.